My name is Monk Rowe, and we are filming in Los Angeles for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. It's a real pleasure for me to have one of my favorite piano players and writers, Roger Kellaway. Thank you, Monk. Welcome. My pleasure to be here. Can I ask you if someone met you that you didn't know at all, and they asked you, what's your profession? How do you describe yourself? I describe myself as an improviser who uses jazz. Okay. So improvising to you is, is not necessarily only a jazz, That's in the correct. jazz idiom. That's right. And the reason that I decided on that particular category for myself is because the idea of what a jazz pianist does is, is too limiting. I've listened to much too much 20th century classical music which is the necessary ingredient for your understanding how it is I play and how I think for me to just think of myself as a jazz pianist because mm -hmm. there's too much uh, Webern and Albenberg and Prokofiev and Stravinsky and, and onward to Stockhausen and Messian and, and more modern composers that have shaped my thinking about what sound is about. And I'm really superimpose many of those ideas over what any given moment on any given tune. When you play, uh, for instance, I'll use it last night as an example. I, I heard you play all blues. Yeah. It was very interesting because we weren't sure what the tune was going to be. And you started uh, playing. You and Bob Magnuson just basically started playing um, do you have an idea before your hit your hands hit the keyboard uh, is where that's going that introduction no well the answer is yes and no because uh, we had never played that tune that way no, until okay. we recorded it uh -huh. uh, the CD has not been released there's a CD called timepiece that's in the can and on that session Bob and I decided to do a Dorian mode uh, improvisation before we start the tune. Mm -hmm. So I don't know when the tune is going to start, but I do know that's the tune that it's, that it's hooked up to. Mm -hmm. There are other times when uh, I've improvised with uh, Eddie Daniels, for instance, where we just start and we go and whatever happens and whatever the tune emerges is the tune that emerges, if, you, if it does. You mean you don't even have... Uh, <laughs> A goal down the road in mind yeah. that it may come into. He may start playing these foolish things or something. Yeah, and, and I may go with it. <laughs> say, well, not, I don't know how to play that one. <laughs> now, in 1980, I uh, I did an album which is also in the can with a wonderful uh, English saxophonist and clarinetist, Tony Coe. Tony was best remembered, or is probably best remembered in history, for having done some of the English uh, Peter Sellers movies with Hank Mancini. Mm -hmm. But I heard him play a couple of love ballads for me, and then I went to an avant-garde concert where he played with Derek Bailey, who is the English equivalent of Anton Webern plays jazz. Ooh. It's unbelievable. <laughs> and I said, that's my guy. Wow. So I took Tony into the studio with uh, John Richards, one of the greatest engineers ever, at, in uh, CTS Wembley, huge studio. And uh, in four hours, we made a free form album. Mm -hmm. We played one blues. That was the last thing we did. Every other tune was of no conception to start off. We just started. And it was amazing because it's so cohesive. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it must have given the the blues a, a, a certain amount of I'm not sure what finality or well, when the you blues, finally got there you could, you could have looked at the you could look at the blues if we were to hear it now uh, more in line with the way you may know how I play because you're familiar with the ground base of what I'm superimposing mm -hmm. my ideas on when it's just free form you are either going to go on the trip or you're not. Mm -hmm. And if you are not comfortable with abstraction, perhaps you won't go mm -hmm. or you'll resist it, which in some sure. cases is a pity and in other cases absolutely not a pity because uh -huh. <laughs> it wasn't worth going in the first place. 
But when did this uh, 20th century, oh, uh, for lack of a better term, classical music, enter into your thinking? You know, it never, I can't remember a time when it wasn't there. Because when I was going to school, and I mean now, I see, it wouldn't be grammar school, probably junior high school. I used to have, uh, you know, people use coffee timers for their coffee. My coffee timer was for my phonograph. Oh. So, so I would wake up and the phonograph would go on. And I would listen to maybe Woody Herman's Third Herd, followed by uh, Alvin Berg's uh, Lulu Suite, followed by maybe Spike Jones, followed by uh, Art Tatum. So the, the mixture of things was always churning. It wasn't until so many years later that what I actually realized was it was all about sound. That's what interests me. I mean, melody interests me greatly also, because it's, especially because it's connected to the heart. But what is the sound of that melody? So the sound spectrum is what interests me. And I like to listen to a whole bunch of different people that, that, uh, that treat the sound spectrum in different ways. Mm -hmm. Like Stravinsky treats it in a, uh, a different way than, uh, than Messian or than Gil Evans. When I listen to, to jazz, it's usually to writers than Duke Ellington uh -huh. or Fletcher Henderson. So that there's a whole historical aspect of how I think also, which comes from Fats Waller and, and then from my buddy Dick Sudhalder, who I went to high school with, mm. and we used to play in his basement uh, and listen to Big Spiderbeck records and all the, and Louis Armstrong and, and all the, wow. the true beginnings of, of the history of jazz. So mm. there's that part of me also. Interesting to see his name recently, too, on a new book. Yeah. Yeah, that's out. I have to... Hope he's to he's an excellent writer, and, uh -huh. and uh, as I mentioned last night, I brought a, uh, a CD with me that he's on that, that is a 40th reunion of a band we played with in, uh, in uh, well, we, we started in junior high school, but in high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, 40 years later, we did another concert together about wow. a year ago, and we, we made a CD of it. It was amazing. Was it true that you were caddies? Yeah. Well, yeah. I was a sea caddy. A sea <laughs> caddy? Yeah, I needed yeah. glasses at the time. I used to have this left-handed oh. lady that divoted every time she hit the ball, and the <laughs> ball would go up in the air, and it only needed to get about 50 feet, and I never could see where it went. And oh, I kept geez. going to the caddy next to me, hey, where's the ball? <laughs> but she loved me. We gave it a future as an umpire or something if we kept that up. Well, the, the guy that played alto sax on the CD is uh, is a member of that country club and, and a mover and shaker in the community. <laughs> All right. And huge real estate mogul and uh, mm -hmm. is building two golf courses as we speak. Okay. One in his backyard so he doesn't have to go anywhere. Right. <laughs> well, let me comment on a few things that I have read and you can tell me if they're, you know, accurate or not. And the, that uh, some of your jazz interests came from hearing George Shearing? George Shearing was my very first influence. I used to play uh, I'll Remember April, which his arrangement came out in sheet music. And when I was 13, uh, I, started, I started crossing over into jazz when I was around that age. And uh, I was a professional at 14. But prior to that, that's I was playing that piece. Mm -hmm. That was my favorite piece of music. I loved those early solo things of George's. And uh, from Shearing, it went on to Billy Taylor, and then Oscar Peterson, mm -hmm. and then Horace Silver. And in, in the interim, Fats Waller was mixed in with all of that. He, uh, Fats, more than any of the others, more than James P. Johnson or any of the others. Jimmy Yancey is a, 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 a boogie piano player that I came across in uh, mm -hmm. the 60s when I was working for a copyist. I had to do some takedowns and I discovered him. Well, you had to listen to the recording? Yeah, and, and there were four tracks it. that were identical. I, I was supposed to make lead sheets for copyright purposes. And I had to figure out these four tracks and how to make them different. But yeah, George... <laughs> George was the first main oh. influence. Uh -huh. 
the New England Conservatory, you went there and you played bass and piano, were you like? The first year I was a piano major and a bass minor. Mm -hmm. And I was studying with uh, Georges Muller on bass, who was the first bassist with the Boston Symphony, and Roland Nadeau on piano. Uh, I had taught myself already how to read uh, bass music and how to play the instrument because in junior high school there were eight pianists that wanted to play and yeah. the band director said, how would you like to play one of those? And I said, fine. So I became a bass player. And I did that for 10 years, including amateur symphony work. Mm -hmm. So it probably contributes to my love for strings a lot. I adore strings. Mm -hmm. And it probably led directly to the formation of my group, the Cello Quartet, which right. is in the 70s. But uh, yeah, I want to talk to I, talk about that, but down the line just a little bit. You played um, your studies in the conservatory were more mostly of a classical nature. Well, they were, except at that time we had a pop department, and a pop no department at no. that time meant a jazz department. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's an important statement. Yeah, I mean, from a historical standpoint, sure. Well, pop music was. Jazz or or jazz tinged. He was much jazz more jazz oriented at, at that time. Uh -huh. Just like uh, what's jazz? I mean, it, it's the it, it's the definition of jazz now has gotten so absurd that uh, there are players that are uh, supposedly qualified as jazz players that aren't jazz players at all, and their mm -hmm. music isn't jazz. Mm -hmm. We don't need to go into that. It's, yeah, yeah. There are too many of them. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, I stayed in the conservatory for two years. Um, the second year, I was a composition major with Judd Cook and uh, a piano minor. And I kept studying bass, and I had choir. Uh, choral was conducted by a woman named Cookie DeVaron. And I had 11 years of, of choral training, which is probably the best year of training that uh, anyone can ever have. But I love singing. Mm. We sung with the Boston Symphony and uh, all the major requiems plus Honegger. And the Honegger Christmas Cantata is one of the greatest pieces ever written for me. And in high school, we played uh, Minotti Zamalna Night Visitors, and we had a very adventurous high school. Wow. We had two years of theory college credit. And uh, an orchestra under Don March that played all the Brandenburg Concerti plus Haydn and Mozart symphonies. And we had a marching band and a jazz band. An amazing Newton High School was, it was like the number three high school in the country. Wow. We there. And that's where Sudhalder and I uh -huh. went to school. And, you know, uh, most of this band, it, Bud Farrington, who was the drummer in our group, who uh, ended up to be a major general, I think it's called, or brigadier general. Oh. Vietnam and yeah. all that. So you went to the guidance counselor at Newton High School, and she says, what do you want to do? At that point in, in your musical development, did, did you have a specific idea of how you wanted to make your living in music? I, no, I didn't. But I did have a specific idea that it was going to be music. Mm -hmm. That happened when I was 12. Mm -hmm. I didn't know exactly where it was going. Yes, I was daydreaming all the time, waiting for the gigs on weekends and uh, and by the time I was 16 I was then playing in Boston and playing Dixieland uh -huh. I was meeting Ruby Braff I was playing with uh, uh, Dick Wetmore who is really an unknown to most people who taught me who Django Reinhardt was he played cornet violin and baritone horn still does prodigy uh -huh. violinist classically but play jazz, and we were doing jazz and poetry, playing uh, 12 off of 12-tone rows uh, with Palmer French, who was reading E.E. E. Cummings. Now, and I'm 16, 17 years old, and going, wow, what is this? Well, and how do I add that uh -huh. to the mix that I just gave you about 15 minutes ago? Unbelievable. You know, to Berg and, you know, S Spike Jones and... Uh, Spike Bix Jones and uh, King Oliver. What, what uh, Spike Jones? He's a you know, a great thing to be influenced by. What, what did you like about Spike Jones? I just love the humor. Yeah. Great humor, and and the lesson from that is, 
uh, as I learned later when I wrote some comedic things, if the players think they're funny, the music isn't. It has to be played straight so that the, the uh. humor of the music makes its own comment. Uh. Well, you had some pretty good musicians pulling yeah, that stuff off, musicians. especially when you watch the live stuff to <laughs> to do what they were doing and, well, we, and play that music. We have a harpist, uh, Goodspeed, I think her name is. She lives in Ojai. She worked with Spike Jones. Mm -hmm. And she told me the oddest story. They were, they were in some theater. And the harp fell off the stage and hit a trampoline, and it bounced up in the air, and Spike came up to her and said, could you do that every night? <laughs> you know, there just, you go. It's the insanity of that. And my father-in-law knows I, one of his good friends, I can't remember if it's Earl Bennett or not, actually also played with, mm -hmm. with Spike Jones and said it was some of the most outrageous times of, of his life. Mm -hmm. I never met him. Uh, I always appreciated his. Yeah outrageous sense of humor. Really? The first compositions of your own, did you start writing in, in high school? We wrote in high school because we had as a graduation assignment in high school, two years of theory, at the end of which you had to write a piece for orchestra. Amazing. Which I wrote a piece for orchestra, for piano and orchestra, and I was going to conduct it, and the pianist never showed up for the rehearsal, so I had to play piano and conduct it. Oh. And uh, that's, that's kind of where it began. Mm -hmm. I had a, uh, a jazz band at the conservatory, and uh, I started doing more compositions then. But then, after that, uh, I went on the road, and I was playing bass with uh, Ralph Martiri's big band, and I, I became part of a, an arranger's competition with Joe Farrell and Bobby Ojeda. At that time, until I met Bobby, I was the youngest member mm -hmm. of, of any band I played in. And Bobby was a year younger than I was. Is he the trumpet player, player yeah. who was with Basie for? Uh, Basie, I think, and uh, I don't know if he, uh, yeah. I don't remember exactly what bands he was with. Maybe Kenton also. Yeah. And uh, 63, early 60s, started getting out with some of the well-known names. In, well, I arrived in, in New York in 1960. Okay. Here's an interesting story. I arrive, and the first night, I meet Bill Takas, bass player. And he takes me to the five spot and introduces me to Jimmy Jufri. I sit in with Jimmy Jufri, and I'm actually offered the job on bass. <laughs> now, as it turns out, I didn't take it, obviously. The next group he had was Paul Blay and Steve Swallow. And that was, he wanted a band of composers. Uh -huh. That happened to me twice. The other person it happened with was Maynard Ferguson, uh -huh. who actually offered me the, the job on bass or piano, or whatever I wanted. I reminded him of that uh, a year ago when we had dinner together, because uh, he lives in Ojai. So that uh, it was an interesting time. I, I, uh, I opted to stay home and uh, write acts for singers and uh, eat lots of hamburgers and milkshakes for a few years and sort of eventually get into the studios. Mm -hmm. And Dave Bailey was looking for a, a pianist. Dave Frischberg was going with uh, Alan Zoot and uh, the position of piano with uh, Clark Terry and Bob Brookmeyer was open and he got me that. Uh -huh. And that became two and a half years and ultimately led to you know, wonderful relationships. Yeah. Clark's a great fellow to work with, oh, I would imagine. Oh, he's fabulous. Yeah. And, and again, here you have the, there's a predictable aspect. I don't mean this as any kind of criticism. This is merely an observation from thinking about the stage of the half note in New York where the piano was always facing uh, one of the walls and the band was behind you. So you never saw 
anybody in the band unless you turned around. Oh. So you never had the, uh, the distraction of anything that was happening visually. Oof. So you just listened for all that time. So there was a kind of straight aheadness and predictability about where Clark would go and a totally unpredictable aspect of, of Brookmeyer. So along with the other scenarios that I've given you, I just, I was into Cage at the time. I was also into a marriage uh, with uh, a woman that uh, absolutely detested everything 20th century and <laughs> really made my life miserable. So I've got to, I'm deeply into 20th century music <laughs> to the point where I, I say, hey, I love this. <laughs> so I was bringing these ideas to the gig. And when Clark wasn't there, it was just Brookmeyer. Sometimes it would happen. Uh -huh. I remember going to a, a, a John Cage concert, and Edgar Varese was there, and I happened to mention it to Dave Bailey. And uh, he, all he said was, I hope you left it there. And I said, oh. And Clark no. wasn't going to come on the first set. It was just Brookmeyer. So oh. I said, all hell broke loose. Oh. I was playing on the piano with drumsticks and just, it, just let it all uh -huh. go wherever it was going to go. <laughs> I knew Bob would go there. Yeah. <laughs> Did the audience go with you? I guess so. Yeah. It's, a long, it's a while ago. <laughs> I mean, we, it, it, it never seemed to be so far out that, that it left any kind of musicality. That was always there. Mm -hmm. Well, 1964, uh, you recorded with Ben Webster, Maynard Ferguson, Wes Montgomery, Sonny Rollins. It wasn't, not Maynard. Not Maynard? No. Okay. But there's still a... Uh, your name was obviously getting around as a... Yeah, those were the, uh, a, the years I was doing things with Oliver Nelson. Mm. Some of the best recordings I ever made, I thought. Alfie with Sonny Rollins, mm -hmm. Bumpin' with Wes Montgomery, and More Blues in the Abstract Truth with Ollie. I mean, yeah. those were really favorite times. Yeah. We'd go into the studio and just eat the music alive. We'd be sight reading and playing it like we played it for three weeks. Mm -hmm. It was amazing, just ferocious. More Blues in the Abstract Truth was uh, designed for three days, and, and we essentially finished in one and just danced in the studio the rest of the time, <laughs> except for More Blues in the Abstract Truth, which was so difficult we had to take that one home and bring it back. Uh -huh. Everything else in that album is a first take. I see. Yeah, he had quite a success with that, the first one, and really made mm -hmm. his name, mm -hmm. didn't he? And he? Incredible talent. Yeah. Bartok lover. Oliver Nelson loved Bartok. Mm. I never, he's one of those, he's one of those people that got away. I, I never spent enough time with him. I adored him. Yeah. And uh, we make assumptions that we don't think about, about relationships, and then we get on in life and suddenly people leave, transform, and, yeah. uh, and that's it, and it's gone. Yeah. And you think, wow, how do I let that one get away? Mm -hmm. But we did spend, spend a little time together, mostly yeah. in the studio. And he preceded you to, uh, to Los Angeles, right? Did he move out or here before you, or are you 66? No, I think I came out first. Uh-huh. Uh, I came out to uh, Las Vegas with, uh, first with Jackie Leonard. I was with Jack for a year and wrote some charts for him and, and essentially was his musical director and I became a stooge uh, for which I learned how to deadpan an audience and get a laugh all the way around. He'd say, was the ground cold when you woke up this morning? I had the, the beard, and, and that was one of his stock lines. Elaborate I, on I that. I can't, uh, it, it, if you're, Jack I mean, was, I'm, okay, Jack was the, the forerunner of the insult comics. Okay, Jackie Leonard, yeah. Yeah, he came before Don Rickles. He was such a sensitive guy, <laughs> it was amazing. He asked me what time it was one night at the Copacabana, and I said, I don't know, I don't have a watch, and the next day was an Henri Giraud watch, and, and it was, and he was so sensitive. I never really got this. 
uh, the, the desire for the perhaps father-son relationship because I was kind of young at the time I was mm. doing this. But I adored him. Uh, he's one of the great people in my life because he was out of vaudeville. And the vaudeville people have a whole feeling about show business that's just different than... Mm -hmm. It's more like the show must go on than the, uh, you know, mental gymnastics that other generations uh -huh. undertake. Yeah. So it was Jack for a year. Well, he would say, was the ground cold when you woke up this morning? Meaning the beard and yeah. hands. And I would do a straight face and I would look out and I would get a laugh. Uh -huh. And what he got me to do was to start with one side of the audience and just slowly pan around as I don't crack a smile. Uh -huh. And I'd get a laugh all the way around. Yeah. It just it sort of was kind of a vaudeville kick and I I, yeah. I really enjoyed that. You then kind of learned the power of understatement too. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I was the guy who always wrote the charts that nobody could play. <laughs> so, yeah. so that was that was Jack and then mm -hmm. Bobby Darren was next. Yeah. How did that come about? With Jack and Bobby Darren, uh, through the two of them, I learned my stage, my sense of stage timing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I don't know how I got that interview. I can tell you that it was, uh, it was on Vine Street at uh, Steve Allen's old office. Um, it, it was an old studio years and years ago. And I walked in, and Bobby was sitting on this big throne chair. It had sort of a 10-foot back to it. I was amused by that. And somewhere <laughs> during the day, he said, uh, uh, well, I, I guess he'd, he had decided that I was OK and that we'd work together. And he said, uh, by the way, go check the files and uh, look for the shadow of your smile. Do, 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 do. You know? So I said, OK. So I went through the files and I found all the charts on the shadow of your smile and I came back and uh, we were opening the following Tuesday in Las Vegas. It was Friday. And I said, I'm sorry, Mr. Darren, there, there doesn't seem to be a chart that goes, the shadow of your smile, the dee dee. It's just a little arrogant. We both had that. He said, his answer to that was, well, it will be by Tuesday, won't there? Uh -huh. That was the beginning of our relationship. Wow. So I took a lot of dictation because he really knew a lot about what he wanted in charts. And at the end of a year, he gave me Dr. Doolittle. He called me up in Las Vegas and he said basically, Kelloy, get your ass over here. I said, okay, I'll be right there. I came over. He said, uh, in three weeks, we're going to record this music. And this is your instrumentation. He gave me the entire instrumentation. I don't know why. And I, I always liked it from a, a challenge aspect. We had 35 pieces and uh, a few mm -hmm. horns. And I, you know, I used Tom Scott and John Guerin and Chuck DeMonaco and, and uh, four track, mind you, mm -hmm. and one track for the vocal. Uh -huh. So only three yeah. track for the orchestra. And uh, I wrote it all in three weeks. And it was wow. completely designed for Bobby because I was totally into him. Yeah. And we've waited 32 years for that to come out on CD. Mm -hmm. Well, CDs haven't been around for 32 years, yeah, but, but the album was so short-lived that uh, you couldn't find it. And it has now just come out. An English company is pressing it, and uh, I, uh, the Music Machine is the, the name of the company, and I think it's Maryland. You mm -hmm. have to call them. You can't find it in a store. But there it is. It's been remixed, and I shall give I shall give Garen a copy of it tonight as a gift. All right, you have a copy already. I have it. Yeah. It's 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 you know, when Some I listen to it. Some of your best work, it, you think? I, I measure my work by uh, I, did I do the very best that I could at the time, mm -hmm. and and this is definitely something that lives with me. I can play some of these charts and just go right back to stage and it's it's the energy and the love and, uh -huh. and all of making music together. It was wonderful. Wow. You and I just, incidentally, as an aside, I just finished a CD which is a Bobby Darren 
homage with Gary Lamell as the vocalist, president of Warner Brothers Music, ex-bass player. And Bobby Columbia of Blood, Sweat, and Tears mm -hmm. is the producer, and I'm the arranger. Wow. We had Elvin Jones. We had the Brecker Brothers. We had, had Bobby Columbia. We were having lunch together, and he said, when was the last vocal album you ever saw Elvin Jones's name on? I guess I so. I said, uh, I've never. He said, yeah, exactly. We're going to use Elvin. I said, OK. So we go to the Jazz Bakery, and we meet Elvin. I hadn't seen Elvin in uh, 15 years. We played something at uh, the mayor's house in, uh, in New York for years and years ago for George Ween or some party. And he said, I'd love to do it. In fact, the first thing he said to me, which is one of the dearest things that anybody's ever said to me, uh, we were hugging and he whispered in my ear, Thad always talked about you. Oh. And, and it was just like, wow. That's high so, praise. Oh, man, how nice. Because I played with uh, Thad's uh, Ball of Fire big band in, in Europe in 83. We did a concert, and mm -hmm. a bunch of recordings. And he was part of uh, More Blues and the Abstract Truth. It's a great company. You've had uh, kind of the cream on a lot of your projects. And, uh, it, you know, it's a long way from Anton Webern to uh, Tom Scott and Joni Mitchell. You really kind of have this huge uh, attention span and curiosity, I guess. Yeah, that's know? what it is. It is. It's a curiosity. It's an insatiable curiosity to understand how different ways of making music uh, are achieved. So if you're writing a comedy, you do one thing. If you're writing a, a horror picture, you're doing another thing. Uh, and, and if it's something that I'm asked to do that I've never done before, I don't say I can't do that. I'd say I can do it, and I do my homework mm -hmm. until I understand how it's done, and then I go about doing it my way. But that's. That's the reason for all that. I love Joni Mitchell. That tour was fabulous, and Garen was on that. Mm -hmm. Garen called me and said, you want to go out of town? I said, yeah, let's go. Because <laughs> Joe Sample wasn't uh, available for the tour. And uh, of course, we had the old quartet, which was uh, Garen, Tom Scott, Chuck DeMonaco, and myself. In fact, uh, it, I was the leader, or Tom was the leader, depending upon who got the gig. Uh huh. So I became part of the LA Express. And uh, my only regret of that whole time is that out of 55 concerts, we recorded nine times. Uh -huh. And there wasn't a single time that Joni liked it. And then Tom and I decided that we were going to go in different directions. So I left the LA Express. And Victor Feldman took my place. And the very next time they recorded became Miles, Miles of Isles. Miles of Isles. Yeah. And that's all the stuff I played 55 times. Gee. <laughs> so I, I, I missed that one. That's uh, not great timing. Um, can I play a couple things for you? Sure. Um, Interesting history. That particular tune? Yeah. It's called In the Heat of the Night. Uh -huh. And uh, it, it was first written uh, as a demonstration for someone that uh, wanted a film theme. And I wrote this piece, and this person said that it wasn't a memorable enough melody. Mm -hmm. Which to me is a joke because that's definitely who I am. I can, I can write a memorable melody. That's, yeah. And, and this is, <clears throat> I guess that's uh, my answer to, uh, my new agent would call it deafness. Oh. And that's why I took this guy on. His name is Stephen Kagan. And one of the things he said to me is, look, let's get this understood right out front. Boy, all it the sounds people, like a producer right all, away. Well, but all the people I'm going to send your music to are deaf. I said, I love you. 
<laughs> Plus, he's a tubist, and, <clears throat> and he reads music, and uh -huh. he understands what creativity is all about. And I mean, how could I not want to be with somebody like that? Oh, okay. I misunderstood. I mean, it's, it's the ground, the grounding of understanding that, that yes, you and I are going to talk about creativity uh, to probably greater lengths than, than maybe either of us ever want to. But once it goes beyond us, out to the business and the people that, that are in control, we're dealing with people that uh, not only do they not know anything about music, but they think you're over the hill if it, 43 is now considered to be the peak of your life as far as working for someone. So if you're 44, you're probably going to get fired. <laughs> Well, but the people who are doing this, I, I assume, are probably younger, uh -huh. and they're kind of accountants. How would they possibly understand, I'm about to be 60 this year, uh -huh. how I could bring all of what it is I know to my craft, and I, I did, it isn't measured. My, uh, my C, the CD timepiece went to Atlantic. The comment came back, one of the most astounding CDs I've ever heard in my life, but I'm not signing anyone over 25. Oh, no. They really said yeah, that? Yeah, that was the comment, yeah. That's a sad state of affairs. Well, it's a stupid state of affairs. It doesn't make any sense. Because mm -hmm. there's, you know, okay, 25 is a nice, nice age. I played a lot of notes at 25. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and how many of them would you throw away now? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Well, according to the way I play some ballads, probably three quarters of them I throw away. <laughs> well, it's just, it's, it's kind of what I'm saying is it's the nature of the business. Yeah. You get into film composition and you hear scores that are written by people who probably did a lot of music videos. They know a lot about technology, but they haven't a clue about how to write. Mm-hmm. There are many who do. Uh, Goldsmith, Jerry, is probably the, the daddy at this point. Yeah. But theme and, and variations and, and uh, uh, meaningful colored th a thematic piece of material that has a color about it that you can identify with and is developed throughout the film is almost non-existent. It isn't even a pattern that uh, the people know, and the people who are many of the people who are making films apparently are are so uh, brainwashed by the idea of the almighty soundtrack album that they keep putting songs in all the time. Mm -hmm. Now think about this: we we come to a point in a film where there's a plot where they, where it's gonna the story's going to move on, and in older times. There was nothing in there except a piece of orchestral music. And we used our imagination as to connecting to the story and how it went forward. Now they give you a song. Why? Because the generations that have grown up from the 60s have been mostly song-oriented people. And they're, the subjectivity of words is what these people are thinking about. They think we need the subjectivity of words to take us from point A to point B, because they do. Because they're the, of the generation that's producing it now, so. Yeah, it's TV stuff. It's all being done for you. There's no imagination. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you don't have a chance to exercise that. Uh -huh. Amazing. <sighs> so I have to feel very lucky about it. My my timing. Yeah. Let me put this on. I have to say that, I'm not sure I can put this into words, that, that piece of music has so many different things in it, so many different emotions and, and styles. Every time I listen to it, it, it seems to, uh, 
take on another dimension. And I'm wondering if other people felt that and if that's why this music caught on with a real core of uh, listeners. I don't know. That core of listeners is still there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll tell you how this happened. You know, I was doing a lot of studio work at the time in the late 60s, and uh, I worked a lot with Edgar Lusgarden. And I had Edgar come over to my house, and we played through a, a, a few original pieces. My desire was to write, uh, I wanted to play piano and cello music, but I wanted to write it. And Edgar was completely uh, okay with that idea, and uh, that gave birth to the cello quartet which became a marriage of wood. That was the whole point of that. Mm. It was cello, piano, bass, and marimba. Now, all these years later, I'm now putting together a remake or another, a new cello quartet, if you want to call it that. And it will be with Chuck DeMonico and Emil Richards again. And the cellist will be Joan Jean Renault of the Kronos String Quartet. Mm. Now, I saw the Kronos Quartet a year ago in Santa Barbara, and I had an instinct just to take a cassette of the cello quartet albums to her, just to see if we had a communication. I'd never met her. Lo and behold, she, she knew the music, she was delighted, and we had a just a, it was a wonderful communication because mm -hmm. I would truthfully like to write some things for Kronos, especially yeah. some jazz things yeah. because I've never been too happy with uh, the kinds of things that are uh, written for them from a jazz standpoint. But to make a long story short, uh, I'm going next week to Tucson to do a, a concert with Paul Horn and somebody from a newspaper called me to do a phone interview and said, by the way, when naturally any kind of an inter interview at some point gets around to the subject of 20th century classical music, perhaps too much for yeah. the jazz people who like me. <laughs> but uh, he said, by the way, the Kronos I, I saw last night and the uh, cellist isn't with him. I said, what? What happened? She's on sabbatical. I called my manager immediately. I said, find Joan Jean Renault. And she called back the next day. And we started talking said, about this idea. Oh. She said, I have nothing going on next fall. Uh, we can get together in June. I have to go to Ireland and play a cello concerto. And uh, so I, I'm very excited about this. Great. With some of this music uh, not notated, um, how do I put it? Well, there was some room for interpretation. Uh, yes. When you think about, for instance, the um, the opening section of Sunrise mm -hmm. for cello and piano is written in note heads. Oh. There are no stems and no bar lines, no expression marks, nothing, merely the note heads. And, and it might be a, a filled-in note head to a note head that, that wouldn't be filled in, which would indicate perhaps a longer, mm -hmm. that I desired for that note to be held longer. But as far as the overall expression that happens, that's up to Edgar. Mm -hmm. And I will do some more pieces like that for Joan, because what it does is it gives the, the classical player an opportunity of reading it as written, which is very comfortable for them, but with uh, the latitude to express it however they wish, and however they express it, I will be with them, because that's completely comfortable for me, uh -huh. whatever the pacing is at yeah. work. So that's as far as the improvisation goes for the cello. Mm -hmm. The music, uh, a lot of it seems to lend itself to some visual images. Has anybody ever approached you about the only thing? That? Uh, years and years and years and years ago, um, there was a piece done on the Today Show with a photographer. 
it was about a photographer. Um, Boyd Matson, I was trying to think of his name. Boyd Matson was the moderator, and Bob Flick had something to do with that before he joined as a head writer for, uh, he's now retired from uh, Entertainment Tonight. So the segment was about a photographer, and they used the cello quartet music, and it worked beautifully. So uh, my wife is in video, and she's thought about it from years, for many years. Um, we'll, we'll get into it. Mm hmm Great. You've done uh, some fairly well-known films, and uh, do you like writing for film? Yeah. Is, yeah. I haven't done it for a long time. Yeah. I mean, I left it for about 14 years until a year and a half ago when this director called me, Karen Arthur called me and said, I've got this project that's, it's, you should really think about it. So it was called Journey of the Heart. It was about a, an autistic uh, savant from Waltham, Massachusetts, unbelievably. Oh. It, 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 he lived, that's where he lives, where I went to junior high school. Oh. And, uh, starring Sybil Shepherd, So I did this movie for CBS, and uh, I, I really enjoy it. I enjoy it a lot. So I'm putting together some MIDI ideas and gear and, mm -hmm. and you know, thinking about getting more into technology. I was just going to, yeah, you make me think of, does your curiosity extend into the uh, available technology these days to supposedly make your life uh, more creative. <laughs> it doesn't make it more creative. And it doesn't make it faster. <laughs> you could see where those I'm the, coming from. Those too. are the two things. <laughs> I went to the NAMM show a couple of years ago, and I went up to, uh, to get a demonstration of uh, Sibelius software, which I've been interested in as a, a writing program. This guy proceeded to show me how to compose with the computer. As I was watching this, I kept saying to him, no, 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 I'm not interested in this. I will never be interested in this. And he said, let me show you how to do this. And I kept saying my line, and he kept, this is what he was going to show me, because he's programmed to show me. I said, look, let me just get this idea straight to you. I write with a pencil and paper. That is how I write. I'm an acoustic person. It's, it has to do with the emotion that my body feels from the ideas going on the paper. And, and the, the pencil of it is the, I don't know, the hands in the earth, or however you want to think of it metaphorically. And I will use the MIDI and computer to realize that. I haven't quite got all this through my head yet, even, mm -hmm. that I don't need to ever go to the studio in a way to do something that's 80 or 90 pieces when I have all of the samples available to me and I just need, you know, I'm learning how to hard drive and uh, record and, and all of those things. But the main ideas go down on paper. I couldn't possibly spend my time clicking a mouse for one note. Whew. When you go, you got a whole chord. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can assign it yeah. to 40 people. Yeah. In a second, no, 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 no. That's that's nonsense. But the, of the idea of perhaps playing an an idea uh, into a synthesizer and suddenly having it printed out for you, that's great. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's a boon. Yeah. And we need to have, uh, I think, combinations of synthetic music and, and acoustic music is is going to be okay. I do find it ironic, however, when people talk about so-called electronic music. Because when I think of electronic music, I think about uh, Stockhausen and Dachstadter and uh, Luning and Yusachevsky and all the people from the, the 60s that I used to listen to mm -hmm. that, that didn't have any of these instruments, Edgar right. Varez. And uh, they were just doing tape manipulation. And it was so adventurous and, and imaginative. Mm -hmm. uh, Alwyn Nikolai, did you ever? No, I'm not familiar with him. <laughs> Alwyn Nikolai. What a guy. I, I was hanging out with some, some kind of out people in New York that really loved avant-garde. And once they discovered that I did, 
they took me down to hear Alan Nikolai one night. And Alan Nikolai Dance Company, he did the costumes, the lighting, the choreography, and the music. And what was astounding, I, I can remember one piece that he did where he had this whole huge piece of plexiglass that came down behind the dancers. And the dancers had wristbands that were attached to the plexiglass so that every time they made a movement, they stretched the plexiglass into Ooh. a different shape and the lights would cascade around the building. And I, wow. <laughs> what is this? Yeah, it went crazy. Cool. What's um, in the can for you right now? Well, we finished the, the Gary Lamel project. That'll come out probably in March. Mm -hmm. That's the Bobby Darren homage, to which we recorded Paula Cole doing uh, uh, the song has escaped me. A Darren song, I assume. Yeah, they, we did Mac the Knife and we did uh, Beyond the Sea uh, of the huge hits. And yeah. everything else that we picked for the album, we picked from songs he recorded, but not necessarily the, uh, uh, the biggest hits. Yeah. I assume you s skipped over Splish Splash. I believe we did. Taking a bath. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Didn't even put my foot in the water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good one. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, he did. Didn't he, want to do that. Did it uh, on stage with him. Uh huh. And did If I Were a Carpenter. And I was, uh, I was aboard some of those recordings. Uh huh. How often do you hear things these days that you're playing on? Well, not very often, because I, I don't listen to oh. anything that would, would tell me. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I have so little time to, it turns out to, to listen. When I'm driving, quite often it's in silence. And fortunately, I'm I blessed with a wife that also agrees with the concept. I bet there's not silence in your head. No, there can be, <laughs> you know, I can be driving along and looking at the mountain range and, and just in, enjoying that existence mm -hmm. without a, a great deal of mentalness. I'm still trying to think of this tune that I recorded oh. Paula Call on. Sammy Khan. Can you hum it? If, I uh, guess if you remember the name, you could hum it right away. Call Me Irresponsible. Ah, there we go. So it's a duet with Paula Cole. She came in and, and sang beautifully, you know, and I, I still really don't know who she is musically. I know she's mm -hmm. a big star and she got five Grammys last year and, and all of that. But in our meeting, she wanted me to dictate what I wanted her to sing in solfege. So right away, my f opinion about her shot up about 25 points. <laughs> she even knew the word, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and I, I said, in my arrogance, uh, okay, movable dough or fixed dough? <laughs> she said, movable dough. I said, great, okay. So I started, I mean, I hadn't even thought about solfege in, uh, in, in probably 30 years. So we're doing do do re mi mi, all the chromatics and everything, and I'm teaching her the lines through solfege. And, and uh, wow. it was great, and she sung beautifully. So that's the duet. That'll probably be AM mm -hmm. crossover. So there's that and, and the, uh, the new cello quartet project and uh, taking on a, uh, a new agent for film mm -hmm. and Gary George is uh, my new manager and he's someone that uh, uh, I, I worked for a couple of his clients years ago but uh, he feels strongly about the film area. And I like that idea. Is the Los Angeles music scene for you, um, I'm not sure how to say this. We always hear about the, the rat race and the it's who you know and uh, all that kind of extraneous to the music. Well, Do you have to partake in that? You see, I never really did. I never played that game. 
uh, I have many colleagues that got a lot more work than I did because they did. They kept going to parties and, and hooking up with this mm -hmm. and networking. I, I'd say probably that I'm more interested in that now than, uh, than I was in the past because I do enjoy it and obviously the more public my image becomes, the more power I have and mm -hmm. the more versatile projects will come to me and the more, yeah. there's just more things I can do. Mm -hmm. It's actually a necessity. I really need that. The, the, when you look at the, the 18 years that I spent being a film composer where my colleagues like Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea and Keith Jarrett didn't do that. They stayed out there. So I waited 18 years and then went out there and I had people saying, wow, where'd you come from? Mm -hmm. uh, or I said, gee, I love Alfie. <laughs> the, those are the, or where's uh -huh. the cello? Don't you play cello? Uh-huh. Oh. <laughs> Don't you play cello. Yeah, That's good. Yeah. So uh, I, I know that uh, I, I'm more interested in a public image now than I ever mm -hmm. have been. But... I live 80 miles away. Interesting. Yeah. So what does that say? Right. Well, I want to live in paradise. Right. Okay. You know, I don't want to be doing meet meetings every day in Hollywood. Right. You have an opinion about the state of jazz music today? Not really, because well, I I mean I I have a few ideas. There are many people that are on the scene that I haven't heard because I really don't spend any time paying attention to what's going on in jazz. If I have an opportunity to listen to something, I want to hear somebody write something. Or I might listen to Rob McConnell or, mm -hmm. or Gil Evans or Duke Ellington, people that are, excuse me, jazz-oriented writers. But uh, to hear um, uh, an album featuring another wonderful player, mm -hmm. Uh, okay, I, I can. I, uh, most of the time, if it's really that good, I I like to be with it. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's fun to to do that. Yeah. Or you hear somebody and say, "Gee, I'd like to play with that person." Uh, I suppose I have the same uh, disgruntled opinion that uh, most people my age have about uh, unedited playing. Unedited. Yeah, people that came up, let's say, on the end of Coltrane and never knew the development of Coltrane. Uh -huh. they, so they, they came up with... Uh, they dee 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 yeah, they started dee listening dee to him yeah, right there. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I happened to walk out on that concert <laughs> <laughs> because I was bored. Uh -huh. And uh, it's extremely difficult to play a solo for 10 or 15 minutes and, and have it be interesting. And I've only met a handful of players in my whole life that could do it. And uh, I'm not sure that Coltrane is one of them. Mm -hmm. But thinking about my background and having grown up through Dixieland, let's not just take Dixieland. Let's go back to Stravinsky's Serenade in A for piano. It was written for 78s. Ah, there you In go. recording, there couldn't be a movement that was over three minutes. Now look at that as a piece of editing. Now you go on to Dixieland, which was also done on 78s. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't do a tune that was beyond three minutes. It wasn't until uh, extended play 45s came in that things started to expand. And yeah. Then LPs. And but the players that are the most interesting to me are the players that have grown up through some degree of editing so that they understand what the shape of a short solo is and mm -hmm. more often than not can play a much longer solo with the same shape or the same understanding of what the mm -hmm. shape of a solo is about. That way you're, you can keep somebody's interest mm -hmm. and it isn't just a matter of self-indulgence. Yeah, it's a good statement and it's interesting when you think about how a music reproduction technology has helped to 
shape the music. The, the limits that were put on it, as you say, really affected the way a person could write, and uh, in some cases, very positively. Mm -hmm. I, ha I have three minutes to make a statement here. Yeah. Now you can, you can uh, take that to film music, and film music will give you, uh, how about 8.7 seconds? <laughs> I like that challenge. Wow. I really do. In many cases, it's a lot easier than 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Get in and get out. Mm. <laughs> and fade out before it goes to black. <laughs> yeah. it's, just a, it's just a technique. Uh -huh. You get to learn, you learn what the technique is, and then you find your ultimate freedom within that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing the, the Bobby Darren project. It's wonderful. Really, it's, uh, you know, we're sitting down at, at lunch and Columbia's looking at me and saying, you know, I'm really thinking about this as extended arrangements. I said, yeah. He said, yeah, some, you know, like five, six, seven minutes. I said, really? With a vocal? He said, yeah, just the vocal is only going to be just like an instrument. I mm -hmm. turned to Gary Lamell. I said, really? You're, you're up for this? He said, yeah, yeah, everything's <laughs> great and love the idea. So I said to, uh, to Bobby Columbia, well, sort of what, what parameters do you want me to think about? He said, oh, I don't know, somewhere between Gil Evans and Klaus Orgerman, I guess. I said, really? licking my chops. <laughs> I said, ooh, baby. So we have this opportunity to, and I got Elvin Jones, and I got the Brecker Brothers, and I've got this wonderful cellist, and we can go, you know. So we went from uh, Easy Living, which is Michael Brecker and myself and cello. We went from there all the way to Mac the Knife with uh, Big Band, Mm -hmm. And going through all the lyrics of Mac the Knife, yeah. including the German lyrics, so there's like oh. ten choruses oh. that start in Germany and then go through Dixieland and then go to modern swing wow. band and then end up in Germany again. It's just well, it's very interesting. I guess they got the right guy to do that. Well, in 1990, <laughs> I, I did a show in Germany. It was a Kurt Weill show for uh -huh. his, I think, his 90th birthday for the WDR band in Cologne. And wow, what a joy that was. And I Katerina Valente uh, singing. Another person from vaudeville, by the way. Mm -hmm. Amazing talent. Well, Mr. Calloway, I'm uh, very glad you joined me today. Well, I'm very pleased because, to be here. Because uh, I've been looking forward to talking to you since hearing your music for many years. And I knew you'd have some interesting things to say. <laughs> I got very charged by this. I, I just Good. got up on a roll here. Yeah. Nice. Well, I hope you have a good uh, session tonight. And thanks, Mark. And I'll be listening. So thanks All for right. your time. Thank you.